Our topic for this problem is capital budgeting and the company we have is Macro Solutions and here is their information. Macro Solutions Inc., a hardware manufacturer, has experienced rapid growth. Macro is considering two new capital expenditure projects and has a weighted average cost of capital of 10%. Okay, so that's just kind of our general, we're gonna be using 10%. Project A requires an investment of 155,000 and Project B requires an investment of 240,000. Wendy Alexander, CFO of Macro, has been asked to analyze both projects and provide a recommendation. She has compiled the following data. And here's our cash flow data. Project A, the cash flow for the five years is $43,000 each year, and for Project B, the cash flow is $60,000 per year. So what are the requirements? We have a number of requirements here. First, we need to calculate the internal rate of return for each project, and we need to show our calculations. And the good news here is that all the cash flows are the same, and so we're going to be able to do this calculation of the internal rate of return using the present value of an annuity table because the cash flows are the same each period. The second requirement, based on the IRR of each project and a capital rationing constraint of $275,000, what recommendations should Alexander make regarding the projects? And explain your answer. And then the next question, very similar, if Macro has no capital rationing constraints, what recommendation should Alexander make regarding the projects? And explain your answer. The fourth requirement, calculate the payback period for both projects. Show your calculations. Assuming a four-year maximum payback, re payback requirement and no other constraint, what recommendation should Alexander make? And explain your answer. The fifth requirement, identify and explain two advantages of using net present value over IRR and one advantage of using IRR over net present value. The sixth requirement, identify and explain three weaknesses of the payback method. And the last requirement, define and explain sensitivity analysis and explain two ways Alexander can use sensitivity analysis to further evaluate proposed projects. So, as usual here, we've got a few number requirements that we need to deal with and also some theoretical ones that we need to write about. But we start with requirement number one, calculate the internal rate of return for each project and show our calculations. Now, as I already said, because our cash flows are the same each year for each of these projects, for both projects, we can use the present value of an annuity table. And just as a reminder here, this isn't part of your answer, but the internal rate of return is that interest rate at which the present value of the project is zero. And so the way we're going to calculate this is we're going to calculate the present value factor, the number off of the present value table, and then we're going to find the interest rate for five years that has the closest table value to what it is that we calculate. So we start with project A, and we know the initial investment is 155,000, and we know that the cash flows are $43,000 per year. That information was given to us in the question. So dividing 155 by 43, we get a table value of 3.605. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're going to be looking for, on the present value of an annuity table, the five years, what interest rate has a factor that is closest to 3.605. And so we have our present value of an annuity table. We're in, this is just part of it, obviously. We're interested in the five years. And then we need to find which of these values in the five years is closest to 3.605. And it is 3.6048, very, very close to 3.605. And so we know that the present value the, the, the internal rate of return for this project is 12%. Okay, we're kind of using that present value of an annuity table backwards instead of taking the 43,000 and multiplying it by 3.6048 to get 155,000. We're just going through it backwards. And then we're going to have to do exactly the same thing for the second project, Project B, $240,000 initial investment and it's a $60,000 per year uh, cash flow, and so we get a table value of four. And again, we go looking through our table value, or the present value of an annuity table, we're looking at that five years, and we see that the value that's closest to four, 3.9927, is actually very, very close to 
the four that we're looking for. And so we know that the present value, or I'm sorry, the internal rate of return for project B is 8%. Okay, and so we've got here 12% for project A, 8% for project B. And that's all we needed to do, calculate the internal rate of return and show our calculations which we have done. Now when we go to the second requirement, we start using this based on the IRR of each project and a capital rationing constraint of $275,000, what recommendations should Alexander make regarding the projects? Now this is where we get into this issue of we only have $275,000. Now fortunately, each project individually is less than $275,000, but we don't have enough money to invest in both of them. Okay? We don't have enough money for both of them, so we need to see what it is that we're going to, to have. So, based on the internal rate of return, project A would be recommended because the internal, re internal rate of return of project A exceeds the weighted average cost of capital. And so there's that weighted average cost of capital. And project B would be rejected because the internal rate of return of project B is below the weighted average cost of capital. That's our assessment. That's how we determine. If the internal rate of return is greater than the required rate of return, here the weighted average cost of capital, the project is acceptable. And so project A is being recommended, project B is not. We need to explain our answer. Project A is the only project that would be recommended based on IRR, and it is also within the capital rationing constraint of $275,000. Project A would be recommended, and project B would not be recommended. Okay, so we explained our answer, we made a recommendation and explained it. Now, requirement three is if macro has no capital rationing constraints, what recommendation should Alexander make regarding the projects? Well, we already determined in requirement two that project B would not be acceptable. It's something that would, is going to be rejected and so Alexander would have no change in her recommendations. Project A would be recommended and project B would be rejected. Although there is no longer a $275,000 capital rationing constraint, it is irrelevant because Project B has an IRR of 8%, which is below the company's cost of capital. We simply wouldn't be making that investment, even if the money was available. And in this requirement where there is no limit, the money is available, but we're still not going to invest in Project B according to the internal rate of return. In requirement four, we look at something else. Requirement four is to calculate the payback period for both projects, show your calculations, then assuming a four-year maximum payback requirement and no other constraint, what recommendation should Alexander make? Explain your answer. Well, what we're looking at here with the payback period is how long it takes for the cash inflows that we get from the project to be equal to the cash outflow from that investment in the project. And because this is just the payback period, not the discounted payback period, we don't have to worry about the time value of money. And so we're not discounting those future cash flows. We're just taking those future cash flows at the amount of those future cash flows. So project A has an investment of 155,000 that's given to us. And we know that the cash flows are $43,000 a year. So after three years, the cash flows would be $129,000. After four years, the cash flows would be $172,000. So we know that the payback period is sometime between year three and sometime between year three and year four. And so if we were to add $26,000 to the $129,000, that would give us $155,000. So we know that the payback period occurs after $26,000 of cash is received in year four. To determine how long it takes in year four, we take the 26,000, divide it by 43,000, so 0.6 years into the year is what we get. And so the payback period for project A is 3.6 years. Okay? Now, and we're told that we have a four-year maximum payback requirement, and this is less than that maximum payback requirement. That's for project A. When we looked at project B, the initial investment is $240,000. After four years, the cash inflows are exactly $240,000, works out very quickly. So there's a four-year payback for project B. Now again, we needed to make certain that we gave some sort of recommendation for this. Okay, we're supposed to 
uh, assuming the four-year maximum payback requirement, what recommendation should Alexander make? So, if the only requirement is a four-year payback period, both Project A and Project B would be recommended because they both have a payback period of four years or less. Okay, so that's our recommendation. Under the payback period, both of these projects are acceptable. Now, requirement number five isn't a numerical question. Identify and explain two advantages of using net present value over IRR and one advantage of using IRR over net present value. Again, this is a, they're asking for two and one, so we want to make certain that we number our answers. So we set it up very easily. The advantages of NPV over IRR include the result is in a dollar amount, which is more straightforward. When we're doing net present value, we get a dollar amount, 100,000, 200,000. And that's much easier to understand than what this interest rate is. Second, there's, it supports different discount rates over the life of the project if the discount rates need to change. And it only requires two, but we have three here. It supports conventional and unconventional cash flow patterns. And that present value does that much more easily. So it asks for two. We've listed three here, but you only need to put two of them. The advantages of the internal rate of return over net present value include, well, first, it's easier to compare projects of different sizes when we're using the internal rate of return instead of net present value. A large project may end up with a large net present value, even though there may not be much of a percentage return on it. And two, again, there's only one required, but the second one, internal rate of return prevents managers from declining beneficial projects just because the rate of return is too low. So we only needed two and one advantages there, but we have three here. Just, again, number your answers when it asks for a certain number. Our sixth requirement is to identify and explain three weaknesses of the payback method. Okay, asks us for three weaknesses. So start, weaknesses of the payback method include, one, it ignores the time value of money. Okay, the discounted payback method does not, but the payback method does. Two, not all cash flows are included in the assessment. Once we get to the payback period, we stop. We don't take any future cash flows into account. And three, it ignores project profitability. Just looking at a time period in terms of cash flows equaling the cash inflows equaling the cash outflow. So three weaknesses, numbered one, two, three, full points for that. Requirement number seven, define and explain sensitivity analysis. Explain two ways Alexander can use sensitivity analysis to further evaluate proposed projects. So what we're talking about here with sensitivity analysis, trying to determine what variables have the greatest impact on the result. So we're changing things and seeing how it is that the end result, the end final analysis is going to change as a result of that. And so in our answer here, we just need to kind of define this and give ways that it can be used. So sensitivity analysis is a tool used to determine the effect of a change in one of the variables of a model to the output of that model. By conducting sensitivity analysis, one can determine the effects of variances from projections and identify risk by finding specific assumptions that can produce large changes in profitability. And this is kind of what we're looking for. What are those things that a little bit of a change is going to cause a great difference in the end result? Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Now, part of this is we also have to determine how Alexander can use this. So ways in which Alexander could use sensitivity analysis include, first, IRR and payback calculations can be determined with differing projections for cash flows or investment, mountain timing, thus giving a range of possible outcomes to utilize to further analyze projects. Sensitivity analysis provides insight to how volatile the outcome of a financial model is to a change in a specific variable or input. And there we have that word volatile, which is a nice word to use here, um, just in terms of what it is that we're trying to measure. Second, sensitivity analysis can identify break-even points. And third, we only needed uh, two of these, I believe. I think it was only a two, two ways that Alexander was able to use this, but we've got three here for you to go ahead and choose from in terms of what it is that we're ultimately looking from or looking at here. But uh, sensitivity analysis can help to define the maximum outflow and minimum inflow necessary to make and keep a capital investment project successful and therefore provide for effective 
decision making. So here are our choices here, some to choose from here in terms of how it is that we can, can get this benefit. But what we're looking at here is really just kind of using the information that we have in sensitivity analysis, making changes and seeing what impact that has on the project as a whole. So a nice question here, we talked about net present value, internal rate of return, the payback period, made some calculations and talked a little bit about what they were, as well as here at the end having this um, discussion of sensitivity analysis, which is also part of what we could be doing. So a good question here, number of different capital budgeting methods being looked at, but again, just a matter of making certain that we provide the number of examples, the number of advantages, disadvantages that they want, and we can go ahead and get full marks for a question like this.